Hi, I'm Michael from Planet Naturopath. In this video today, I'm going to go through the new GI map test, show you the three new markers and what changes have been done to the GI map test compared to the old test. So let's go through this test now. So on the first page of the test, we've got the bacterial pathogens, and this is just a sample report. So with the bacterial pathogens, these are the bacteria that ideally the level should be zero. So the changes that have been done to the new test is that if it's previously, if it was marked uh, below range, but still present, it was just marked in black. But now there's like a, a yellowy sort of color there. And this is to highlight that even though it's below the reference range, this could still be a problematic level because with the reference range, this is looking at an acute infection, not necessarily uh, a low-grade infection or a chronic infection. So for someone like this, we would always look at the symptoms and if they're symptomatic, you may look at treating Yersinia. With the C. diff, with the levels being high, this doesn't mean they're, they have an active infection, but they have the C. diff uh, spores present. So they have the ability to produce toxins. And once again, we would take it into account someone's signs and symptoms. And with the, with the results, they sort of explain what the numbers mean here. So with, for example, 4.46 looks like it's larger than one, but it's the E3 and the E5 that's the most important. So if something's 1.0 E1, it's 10 cells per gram of stool. If it's E2, it's 100, E3, 1000. And it just keeps on going up uh, every number. So for example, this would be f around 4,400 cells per gram of stool and it's considered uh, normal less than 100,000 cells. So this is a lot lower than the, than the reference range. On the next page, we've got the Helicobacter pylori, and there's been no changes here. The test measures the level of bacteria as well as the virulence factors. So once again, um, 2.9 E3, it's higher than one E3. So this is a high level infection and if someone didn't have the positive virulence factors, you wouldn't necessarily treat this. You would once again look at someone's signs and symptoms. And But with the positive virulence factors, even if this was not high here, I'd be looking at treating this type of infection because the virulence factors indicate uh, a greater chance of ulcers, gastric cancer, and problems from the helicobacter. If you were negative for the virulence factors and had H. pylori present, it's a very common bacteria. You would take into account, you know, whether someone had H. pylori symptoms or other lower GI symptoms that can be caused by Helicobacter pylori. The commensal bacteria, they're now called commensal keystone bacteria because these are the bacteria that are beneficial for good health. Some of them like Enterococcus and Escherichia you don't want them too low, but you also don't want them too high. They can also be very pro-inflammation causing. The Rosburia is the new marker on this test. It's a key short chain fatty acid producer and the most uh, well-known short chain fatty acid is butyrate. Butyrate is important for reducing inflammation, helping with beneficial bacteria. And a lot of the benefits of probiotics is because they make things like butyrate. So Rosburia, Fecal Bacterium Prausnitzi, they're both uh, important butyrate producers, like uh, Lactobacillus as well, but these are, these are the two of the most important ones. The Bacteroides and the Firmicutes are the overall classes of bacteria. So they make up 80 to 90% of your gut bacteria. And for example, the Lactobacillus is a species that comes under the Firmicutes class. So you want these, uh, and this is another new part of the test. Before we didn't have these um, green, red, sort of yellow colors here. You want to be around the middle or definitely in the green part for these bacteria. So for example, the Firmicutes is a little bit low. With the opportunistic or overgrowth microbes, these are bacteria that at low levels, they may not be an issue, but at high levels, they can be problematic. And for example, these ones here, like everybody is going to have, um, or not everybody, but you, it's common to have low levels, but 
it's only a problem if it becomes high level infections. And another new marker on the test is the desalvibrio species. These are hydrogen sulfide producers and that can contribute to a lot more inflammation in the gut, uh, can be a cause of hydrogen sulfide SIBO. The ranges for methanobacteria, which can contribute to methane uh, SIBO, have been adjusted. And the Enterobacter and Escherichia, which are also further up, they're also down here in the autoimmune related bacteria because they can be triggers for autoimmune disease. So these bacteria, they're known as commensal, so they're normally there, but you just don't want them to be at high levels. Whereas these inflammatory autoimmune bacteria, ideally they'd be zero. The yeast and fungi viral markers are, nothing's changed here, the same same uh, bacteria, I mean, sorry, the same viruses and fungi are being tested and obviously you don't want high levels of candida. And these viruses are just measuring active infections. A lot of people have had these viruses in the past, but just looking if you have a, an active infection. With the parasites, these are parasites that are almost commensal, like a lot of people can have these bacteria. So what that means, I mean, sorry, parasites, and at low levels, it may not be an issue, but when they get to be elevated, these parasites like blastocystis and deentamoeba can be problematic. The other big change is the intestinal health markers, and the new marker is the azonophil activation protein. This is a marker of the, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but also other diseases where there's been an increase in azonophil action, so it could be acute diarrhea, food allergies, um, even, even chronic GERD could lead to an increased azonophil activation. So this combined with calprotectin can be markers to tr um, analyze how you're progressing with inflammatory bowel disease and whether it's in remission or whether it's still, you know, in an active state. Steatocrit is the fat in the stool. So you want that to be as low as possible. Elastase is your pancreatic enzymes. So the reference range is above 200, which is down here, but ideally you want to be you know, above 500 in the higher end of the range. Beta-glucuronidase is a detoxification marker. So high levels can lead to reabsorption, not just of um, environmental toxins, endotoxins from the body, also like estrogens. So this can, high levels can be a cause of estrogen dominance in men and women. With blood, ideally you want to be zero. It can be common to have you know a low level, but you don't want you know high levels of blood that can indicate something more serious and needs more investigation. Secretory immunoglobulin A is part of the immune response. So low levels are not ideal, and they can be from chronic health problems, chronic fatigue, adrenal issues, chronic stress, and high levels can be when there's acute infections. The gliadin IgA marker, it used to be less than 155, that's been modified to 175. And you still don't wanna be in this sort of gray area here. If someone's getting symptoms of gluten intolerance and and they're you know, above 150, you might wanna trial or just a gluten-free diet or do some more advanced testing like the Cyrex Array 3. And then the last marker, zonulin, the reference range has also been modified. It used to be down here. And this is a intestinal permeability marker or leaky gut marker. So high levels means that uh, toxins from the intestines can get into the bloodstream. That can cause a wide range of symptoms from skin problems, headaches, even joint pain and inflammation, um, brain fog. So that's why some people can have bacterial overgrowth but if they don't have leaky gut, they may not have systemic symptoms. But with leaky gut, you're more likely to have systemic symptoms with gut issues. And the last page is just looking at antibiotic resistance to H. pylori. And using antibiotics is not the only way of treating H. pylori, but it's one way. Uh, but about 40% of the US population is uh, resistant to, to clarithromycin. So these are common antibiotics that are used to treat H. pylori, but for someone like this, 
they would be ineffective. They wouldn't be harmful, they'd just be ineffective. So you would take antibiotics for no reason and you still have the H. pylori. And I guess in some ways it could be harmful because it's going to create more dysbiosis in the commensal bacteria. So I hope that helps you understand the new changes to the GI map test. This I still think is one of the best tests for measuring gut health and identifying not just digestion problems, but the underlying cause to other you know, health issues like autoimmune problems, other chronic health issues could come from the gut. So doing a GI map test is a good idea.